Um, so, thanks everyone for coming along this morning. Um, I know there was a few good talks on, so I'm happy to see so many people here. Um, so today, obviously, talking about your your super-powered Windows Infrastructure Toolkit. Um, so I'm Josh King. I blogged, well, I blog sometimes at toastit.dev. Uh, you can find me on Mastodon at Windows at mastodon.nz. Um, and I'm an infrastructure ops, uh, ops engineer at Chocolatey. Um, so sometimes I'll be at the booth just outside there. If you haven't already got a t-shirt, come and find us. Um, so of course, talking about a super-powered Windows infrastructure toolkit, let's start by having a look at a typical one or what my typical toolkit was um, a couple of uh, jobs ago. So of course, we've got PowerShell. That's sort of why we're all here. Um, and then we've got more PowerShell, but probably with a timer or a schedule or something against it. Um, and I know Stephen Judd did a talk about um, task scheduler yesterday, so um, if you didn't see that, go and watch the recording when they're up. And if you're really lucky, and I wasn't, you'll have some PowerShell Core or PowerShell 7 in the mix as well. Um, and, of course, we're writing all of that PowerShell with our favorite editor, VS Code. Um, so today, I want to make the case for adding Ansible to your toolkit, um, and specifically in a Windows environment. So um, one, of the, one of the things you'll find about Ansible is it is very Linux first. Um, but you can make it work in a Windows environment. And I want to stress the point that you can pick up Ansible and add that to your toolkit without throwing away your investment in, in PowerShell. And in fact, as you'll see in the demo, you need to um, lean on PowerShell uh, potentially pretty quickly. <laughs> um, and then we're gonna layer on top of that some easy software management with Chocolatey um, via Ansible. Now, there's a few options in the infrastructure as code space, so why Ansible? So I'm oversimplifying things a bit here, but infrastructure as code, as the broad term, can be sort of separated into your infrastructure provisioning and your config management. Um, so inf infrastructure provisioning being, you know, creating your VMs, um, virtual networks, storage, all of that sort of stuff, and configuration management is, say, setting up those VMs so that they actually do the tasks they're designed to do. Um, and there's tools that specialize in each of those camps. So on the infrastructure provisioning side, you've got tools like Terraform, Pulumi, um, AWS CloudFormation, I think. I, I, of course, just put the icons there and not the, <laughs> not the names of them. Um, and then you've got ARM templates or Bicep as well. And sort of over in the configuration management camp, you've got tools like Chef, Puppet, and SaltStack. Um, and it, for me, um, while it sort of technically sits more on the config management side of things, um, Ansible sort of straddles those two things. It does a good enough job at infrastructure provisioning, a good enough job at config management that you can do both. And you can stretch the other tools to cross camps as well. Um, but for me, Ansible does the best job, and uh, the best job at both of those things, meaning I only have to learn one tool. Um, so I'm assuming everyone here is um, at least okay with PowerShell. So I'm going to use some terminology for PowerShell for level set, some terminology from Ansible, because there are some overlapping terms and they don't mean the same things. So in Ansible, you've got collections. Um, and those equate roughly to modules in PowerShell. So those are the, the most easily shareable um, artifacts. So um, say with a module, you down that, download that from the PowerShell gallery. With Ansible, you download collections from the Ansible 
sorry. PowerShell Gallery, you download collections from Ansible Galaxy. Hard for me to get my mouth around sometimes. Um, then just to confuse, thing, is confuse things, in Ansible you've got modules which I equate to commandlets in PowerShell, and I am oversimplifying that a bit. But effectively what I mean, and specifically I'm talking about compiled commandlets. So um, on the PowerShell side I'm talking things written in C Sharp rather than functions or advanced functions that are written in PowerShell themselves. Um, and modules in the Ansible side of things are what's actually doing the work. So they're what you call in your Ansible code to do things. Um, and they can be written in Python, PowerShell, basically not raw Ansible. Then stepping down, you've got roles in Ansible, functions in PowerShell. Um, and so the distinction here for me is functions you write, uh, functions in PowerShell you write with PowerShell. Roles in Ansible tend to be just a set of Ansible tasks. And then finally, playbooks and script files. These are the things you're actually running um, to do a job. I see photos being taken, so I'll... <laughs> Now, the elephant in the room when we're talking about um, Ansible is um, YAML. So you, the, the big thing to be aware of with Ansible is that it is, the indents are important. Um, so I highly recommend an uh, extension in VS Code that's gonna highlight those extensions, uh, sorry, those indents to you. Because um, I've lost hours to missing white space, and it's not fun. Um, but I, before diving into the demo, I did want to sort of take a snippet of YAML out and just sort of highlight what you're actually seeing there. So we talked about collections. Um, the collection being used for this task is the community.windows collection. And from that, I'm using the win desk. Uh, the WinDesk image module. One thing you'll um, see pretty quickly is basically every module that's meant to be run on Windows has that win underscore um, prefix. Uh, so for example, if there was a Linux version of WinDisk image, it would just be disk image. Um, yeah, yeah, so that's, that's the convention. My silent protest is that anything I'm doing for myself internally, I put Nix underscore in front of anything Linux. But, um, um, and so I mentioned, um, well actually I didn't mention on that term term terminology thing, you can ship both modules and, and roles in a collection. You don't call them the same way, so you couldn't just swap out that module there for a role for a role that's sitting in there and just expect it to run. You need to run it through another module called include or import uh, role. Um, we don't do that in the demo, but we do do something very similar, so I'll point that out when we get there. Then everything that lines up on the left-hand side there is a task keyword that's basically telling Ansible um, what to run and how to run it, um, and or say what to do with the output. So here, um, we're telling it what module to run from what collection, which is the, uh, of course, that bit we just highlighted before, the community.windows. Um, then um, specifying a custom name so that <clears throat> in the output from Ansible and any logging, it's got a nice human readable name there rather than something auto-generated or just the name of the, the, name of the collection, uh, sorry, the name of the module. And then finally down the bottom, register basically says any output from this um, module, go and save it into this variable. Um, so you can potentially do stuff with it later, like specifically here it's knowing where the disk, like what disk letter the disk was, uh, the image was mounted to, that sort of thing. Um, as far as telling the module what to do, we've got parameters. So, a module ha can have lots of parameters. Um, 
but you only need to specify the ones that you need to interact with, as you might expect. Um, so for this one, I'm telling it the image path, which sits somewhere on disk, and I'm telling it um, the state is present. Now that's the default state, um, but what that, what that says in this context is mount the disk. Uh, the opposite of present is absent, and if you say absent, it'll unmount the disk. If you're doing something like creating a file or folder, present would create, ensure that the folder existed, um, and absent would delete it. And then the weird orange text and curly braces here are variables. They're not always variables, but um, I think initially, any time you see curly braces like that, uh, double curly braces, it's going to be a variable. So for example, later on, I could do two curly braces and this underscore VHDX mount um, to get that information that came from this module. <coughs> now, who's familiar with chocolatey? Good. So I won't spend too long on this. Um, so just real quick, chocolatey's a package manager for Windows. Think apt yum DNF on Linux or Homebrew on Mac, and technically Linux. Um, it allows you to install, upgrade, uninstall packages from the command line. Um, using it, you've got access to almost 10,000 packages on the community repository, although um, putting my ops hat on, if you're an organization, you shouldn't be using that directly, but that's another conversation. Um, we've been around 12 years. As I said, I work for Chocolatey. Um, and there are commercial components available. They technically pay my bills, um, but everything we talk about today is free. Um, and like I say, I'm an op, so I'm not trying to sell anything. Um, but the question is, why Chocolatey and Ansible together? So we, we being Chocolatey, maintain a first party Ansible collection called chocolatey.chocolatey. Um, and it's actually installed out of the box when you install Ansible, along with a couple of the Windows modules. Um, so when you install Ansible, you'll have the chocolatey.chocolatey module available. Um, just like running the CLI, it allows you to uh, manage your packages. So again, that's install, uninstall, upgrade, uh, pin, all that sort of stuff. And it also allows you to manage um, chocolatey features on there. So of course, being Ansible, um, you can define in your infrastructure as code um, that you want certain sources, say, set for all of your endpoints. Um, you can do that via, via the Ansible module uh, collection. Um, the modules in there, for the most part, are item potent or can be, um, meaning um, you can rerun the playbooks and it'll only make changes when changes are needed. Um, so if something's already installed and you say, I need this thing installed, if it's the correct version, it's not going to reinstall the thing. Um, and it is really fun when you're on a video call talking about the thing, trying to say chocolatey.chocolatey.win underscore chocolatey. Um, so we're about to dive into demos. Before we do, I want to quickly touch on the lab that I'm using here. So Ansible runs on Linux, so I've got a Linux VM running um, that has Ansible already installed. I've also got a Hyper-V um, server running um, that we're going to spin some VMs up on. And I've got a WinRM connection between my Linux box and my Windows server. And just because I don't trust conference Wi-Fi, I'm also running a Sonotype Nexus repository on there for the chocolatey side of things, so I don't need to reach out to the internet. Um, I think I've got it down to one thing in the whole demo that goes out to the internet, and hopefully that works. Um, when I'm demoing this sort of stuff, I generally prefer doing it with a cloud provider like AWS or Azure. Um, mainly because I can avoid having to show PowerShell stuff really early in the demo. Um, because I didn't want to trust the Wi-Fi, I'm using Hyper-V, which means we are going to see PowerShell a lot sooner than um, I normally intend on. Um, so with that out of the way, let's create some VMs. Uh, 
oh, and I guess I should say the end goal of this is we're going to spin up two VMs, they're going to be web servers, um, we're going to apply a baseline um, configuration against them, uh, set them up as web servers, and then we're going to harden them a little bit. So I've got a sort of stripped down um, hardening playbook there that will run. And just to show, I told this not to turn off its screen. Um, just to show I don't have anything up my sleeve, this is my um, Hyper-V box. That could be bigger. It's already 125%. No, that's not going to... Oh, it did. Cool. Okay. Um, so this is my Hyper-V box. Currently no running VMs. Um, on the disk, I've got a... Windows Server ISO, I've got a reference disk created from that ISO, and I'm pretty sure I've included the script that I used to create that disk, if anyone's interested, um, with the code for this. If I don't, ping me, and I'll add it to my PR. Um, and of course, we've got no VMs running at the moment. So, let's create some VMs. Um, so I mentioned, sorry, just deciding if I want to run this now while I'm talking, I probably should. Um, so to run a playbook, you can run ansible-playbook and then just specify the, the name of it. So I want to run the first one, and that'll just tick along down the bottom there and I'll explain the output in a bit. Um, <coughs> So, I mentioned I've got a WinRM connection up to, um, or open between my Linux box and that Windows box. Um, the first thing is telling Ansible information about that box, so how, how to connect to it. And you do that via an inventory, which is where you um, list out, um, well, you tell Ansible about all your hosts. And that starts with a hosts file. Now this file can be a lot of different formats. Um, I've stuck with YAML because everything else is YAML, so um, <coughs> it's just easier. Well, no, sorry, let me rephrase that. It's not easier, it's consistent. <laughs> uh, so up the top of your, yeah, I, I'm gonna wash my mouth out after this. <laughs> Um, so up the top there is a all group, which basically allows you to say, I want to run this Ansible against all of my hosts. Um, and for this demo environment, I've got my uh, Linux server that's running Ansible, I've got my Hyper-V box, and we're gonna be spinning up the two, um, the two guests. Now, the children under that all group are child groups, where I've basically said, these are my Hyper-V hosts, these are my Hyper-V guests, and also Windows servers and Linux servers. Those map to uh, group variables and host variables. So for each of these groups, I've got a file, another YAML file for, um, for each of them. So if there were any variables I wanted to set that apply to all of my hosts, I could put them in this file. Um, so for example, if you wanted a, um, if you wanted um, your company name in there, for example, so that you could reference it when you're doing anything, I guess. Um, you could put it in there, and then all of your hosts would have access to that. Um, to that. Um, in this case, it's empty, because I don't need it. Um, I also don't need any um, Linux variables, so that's, that one's empty as well. Um, as far as connecting to to my machine, I've had to tell um, Ansible some uh, specifics about WinRM, um, like what port to use, um, what authentication scheme to use, um, and to ignore any uh, certificate um, validation because I'm not using any certificates. Um, You'll see we're using NTLM here for the WinRM transport. That allows you to use just a username and password on a um, work group machine um, without having to mess with trusted hosts or anything like that. <coughs> uh, 
Um, and the, this one technically isn't needed, but I've included it um, because when I don't, I forget about it when I do need it. Effectively, you're telling Ansible to use the support um, 5985 to connect via WinRM, which is a, the well-known WinRM port. If you happen to use something else like 55985 because you're behind a NAT or something, um, Ansible suddenly doesn't know what protocol to use and things fall apart. Um, and funnily enough, my boss at Chocolatey wrote a blog post about that exact problem. And every time I run into it, I find that blog post and smack my head because <laughs> I know what the issue is. Um, then I guess we can keep going through this file while we've got it open. Um, so I mentioned I've got a Nexus repository running on my Hyper-V server for Chocolatey. So I've got information here about how my servers can connect to that. So there's the URL for it there, and it needs a username and password, so that's there. Now, Ansible Vault is just a way for Ansible to encrypt strings um, and files. Here, it's um, just using a key, <coughs> a key to decrypt that um, string. And um, I've replaced that with um, I've replaced that with just a placeholder in um, in the demo code that's been uploaded to GitHub. Just um, ideally, um, you should well when you move on to using a automation platform for Ansible, like for example Ansible Tower, you know, Ansible automation platform or AWX or something else you can get that platform to administer your credentials instead of saving them in the inventory, which is probably a better idea. Or you can pull them from a secret vault. Um, but for ease of demonstration, encrypted secret. At least I'm not showing the raw password, I guess. Um, and then this is, so this is the group vars for my Windows servers, so this applies to anything under that group. Um, so I'm saying I want these two packages installed on all of my Windows servers. And for later on when we're doing hardening, I need to know where these um, .pol file files sit. So I've saved those um, there as well for easy reference. Now, my hosts, or my host, um, I had some information here for when I was setting up the host. Um, and also we need it for creating the VM. Um, basically, just defining things like where I want the VMs to sit, where, I, where my um, reference disk is sitting and um, some default variables for what I want my uh, network interface to be called on the server, um, not in the guests. Um, and also what the default size of that reference disk is. Then my guests, on the other hand, uh, defaults for how I want my VM set up. Um, so you'll notice my disk is a little bit smaller. That's just because I didn't want to chew up the hard drive on this laptop. Um, I want my guests to start with four gigs of memory. And how my script works is if I've got min and max specified, um, it'll turn on that auto scaling um, in Hyper-V. But it's all the same value anyway, so it, it's not going to do anything. Um, I also want to start with three CPUs on each um, server and turn on auto start. Now, any host that's in that group will get all of these variables, but you can override them with host-specific variables. So quickly, um, my Hyper-V server, um, this one just has information for Ansible to know how to connect to my host, or sorry, where my host is and what account to use. So I've given it the IP address, this could also be an FQDN, um, and the username and password, same deal. Passwords being run through Ansible Vault so that um, I'm not showing raw passwords. Um, and I've overridden the nickname, the, the nickname, the network interface name um, for my for my host uh, for my Hyper-V server um, so that it's specific to that host, that server. And again, for one of the VMs that we're setting up, I've got a. Uh, IP address, username and password. Um, and because we're setting up a brand new machine, 
Um, I've not only told it how to connect via Ansible, I've also told it what the, um, the, the admin password should be in Windows as well. Um, and we, um, it'll use that for um, when it's spinning up the box. Then just some other information like what its local IP address is, which happens to reference that um, the Hyper-V host variable from up top. Uh, the gateway, friendly host name, and some other bits and pieces that we use. And then I'm overriding those memory and CPU um, variables from the group bars. Um, so here, because of a quirk in how I wrote my code, if it's an empty string, it turns off that auto-scaling in the memory. Um, so I've done that, and four CPUs. Uh, the only difference between this and the other VM is this one's marked as prod and the other one's marked as dev. Although, maybe dev doesn't need eight gigs of memory, but whatever, it's done. Now, all of that, oh, very quickly, this config file here tells Ansible where my inventory file is and where, um, where to find the file that'll unlock those very well decrypt those variables that I've run through Ansible Vault. Um, and I specifically put that outside of the scope of what I'm showing here, so I can't accidentally show that password or that file. Uh, right. Okay. So this is um, the first playbook that's actually already finished running. Um, so this is targeting Havoc, which is my um, Hyper-V server, and effectively what it's doing is it's going to create my two VMs, obviously. Now, what, how it creates those VMs is it runs through a bunch of tasks, and each time it does that, of course, the task is basically duplicated. So what I've done is I've split all those tasks off into their own file, and I call in the tasks from that file, um, with the, this built-in import tasks uh, module. And then just reference it where it sits. Now, because this is targeting Havoc, which is the Hyper-V server, it doesn't actually know intrinsically what the variables are that apply to the guests that it's turning on. So what you can do is you can reference other hosts' variables um, by dipping into the host vars variable and sort of specifying the host and then what specific variable you want from that host. Um, so the only difference in this playbook between those two, uh, those two is the name of the host that it's collecting the variables from. Um, and what that does is it says, when you run this, bring in these variables. Right? Um, and we'll have a look really quickly through that task list because I think I'm running a bit behind on my time. Um, but then after, um, to make sure that those VMs actually spun up correctly, um, there's a second play in this playbook which targets my two Hyper-V guests. Um, and the only task it does is it says wait for connection. So it just sits there probing the machine until it, can successfully connect using um, using the WinRM information that it's got available to it. So, um, yeah, so it can successfully connect. Um, and the other difference between these, as you can see, this says gather facts false, and this says gather facts true. Um, one of the first things Ansible does by default, unless you tell it not to, is it'll connect to the machine and pull back a bunch of information about it. Um, You'll get, um, say, hardware information about how many CPUs, um, memory it's got, disk configuration, everything. There's a ton of information in there. Um, OS versions, all of that sort of stuff. Um, you technically don't need to put GatherFax true up the top. If you don't, it'll just do it. Um, but it's one of those things where I put it there so I remember I can turn that off if I want to because um, it's not always needed. Um, really quickly. Um, I'm not even going to open that first bit. I've got some, um, some code in that first 30-odd lines which says um, 
if the demo environment's already set up, I can specify a variable that'll tear it all down and um, start again. Um, so feel free to explore that um, if you're looking at this code. Um, but let's go straight to this and straight away PowerShell. Um, so in the Ansible Windows collection, there is a win underscore PowerShell module, um, which allows you to um, specify and run a script. Um, and when you use this module, you've got a automatic variable called dollar sign Ansible, or I guess Ansible, um, which you can use to feed information back to Ansible itself. Um, so if we look at the output from this, whoops, wrong one. You can see, um, the output of each of these steps. Um, the yellow means change, something changed on the box, um, or it did something. In fact, that one should. Not sure if that should technically say changed reading what it does. Um, but there's also green ones that say OK, which basically mean um, I didn't need to change anything, or I was just um, gathering information, or you know, um, checking something. Um, now, the, the win underscore uh, PowerShell module always says it changed something unless you set changed on that automatic variable to false. Um, so what I, what I do when I'm doing, um, when I'm running PowerShell in this context, I have a habit of always setting change to false. And then if I actually change something with the PowerShell, I'll set it to true explicitly. Here though, um, I've set it to false because all this is doing is some fact finding. Um, so I'm checking to see if the, if the VM exists. If it doesn't, um, if it does, um, I set this other property on the Ansible uh, variable called result to true, and if it if it does exist, I set it to true. If it does doesn't exist, I set it to false, and then I register that output so that I can tell later on um, whether or not the VM's already there. And in fact, we do that right away. Um, so here, I only run this block. Um, so under here is a bunch of tasks that will expand and see. I only run this if the result from that previous step is false. So because it's a Boolean value, you don't need to um, you don't need to do any interesting comparisons. You can just say if true or if false, basically. Um, and that uh, so if it doesn't exist, uh, we are going to do a bunch of things. We'll create a folder for the VM to live in using win file. Um, we'll copy the uh, reference disk in there. Um, now, by default, this win underscore copy module is intended to copy things from your Ansible's host to the remote machine. Um, but because the reference disk lives on the reference oh, on the target machine, you can say um, that the source is also remote. Um, so it just does a local copy on the end box. Um, then we resize the VHD, uh, VHDX, um, only if the, the target size is different than the default size based on those uh, variables that we've got. And note here, um, I haven't adjusted whether or not it changed. Because of that when statement, something has to change here. So I've just gone, okay, do your default and um, tell me something changed. Uh, then this is the example from uh, the presentation where we mount that VHD file. We are going to expand the OS partition so that, because again, it's different than the default, so we need to make sure that lines up in the OS. Um, and we're using an unattend file to set up Windows, and it needs passwords in a specific format. Um, so 
the administrator password. The format for that is a base64 encoded string, which is the password with administrator password behind it, which um, I knew back on my, ad, uh, my help desk days, completely forgot, and when I saw that again, I went, well, that's stupid. Um, but then for my, um, for my Ansible account, same thing, base64 encoded, but this is just a password, it's not the admin password. So that gets just password appended to the end of it. Um, then I am using set fact to take the output from those last two steps and put them into other variables. Um, these just make them easier to reference later on. Uh, and then my favorite part of Ansible are actually um, these Jinja 2 templates. So um, we've got that VHD mounted. Um, we've got access to the file system on it. We're gonna drop the unattend file on it. And we're doing that via a template, uh, win template. And what that allows us to do is in this effectively XML file, um, the convention for these templates is just to call them .j2 for JSON, uh, sorry, JSON2, Jinja2. Uh, um, and what that allows you to do is rather than just copy a file to disk um, as it is, this will go and um, evaluate any of the values that are in here and replace their values with whatever string is sitting behind them. Um, and you can manipulate those variables as well. So for example, um, here I'm setting the local account, uh, well, I'm adding a local account for my Ansible user, um, but I've piped that variable to a filter called upper or a plugin called upper. So that's going to set that display name for that user to be uppercase. And we'll see that when we go to log into the VM. Um, and you can also do things like, I haven't defined an uh, owner organization or an owner, so we can tell it what the default strings are. So if that's not being defined, it's going to use example inc instead. Um, and also, if we don't specify a DNS server, it's going to default to Google. Uh, is there anything else interesting in here? Yeah, just those defaults again, friendly host name for the computer name, that sort of stuff. So that's going to drop those files on, uh, evaluate those strings and pop it on disk for us. Uh, finally, well, rounding it out, we are going to drop some uh, scripts on disk as well. This one, um, configures the box for the WinRM remoting. Um, and like my comment says there, I normally download this, but I don't trust the, um, the conference Wi-Fi. So I've um, grabbed a copy of it, and I'm copying it here, copying it from my Linux box to the Windows box, and that's just sitting as a file um, in my files folder there. Um, one thing I'll point out really quick is I didn't have to specify what folder that's sitting in. So win copy automatically looks in the files folder and win template automatically looks in the templates folder. Um, back here, I had to tell it where the task was because that doesn't automatically look under the tasks folder, but I like to put them in there anyway to um, keep things neat. Um, then set up complete, so with this .cmd file sitting in that specific folder, it's going to run as part of the, um, the unattended install. And that one's another template. And the only reason that's a template is it because, because it needs to know the name of my Ansible user, because um, it's setting that username, uh, sorry, that, part, that account to never expire. Um, and it's also deleting a bunch of files that may or may not have passwords sitting in them um, that I don't want to leave on disk. And then finally, unmount the VHD and run a bun, oh, yeah, see that's absent there, as I said before, means unmount um, when you're going through one disk image. Then finally, launch a PowerShell to spin up the VM uh, create the VM and start it. 
the output of all of that is this. Um, I'll go back to that because remembering I targeted my Hyper-V server for most of that. Um, and then the last thing was trying to connect to my two VMs. And that output's too big. Oh well, I'm not going to change it now. Um, so you can see in the recap at the bottom that I got two, uh, an OK each on my two VMs, basically saying, yep, I can connect, all good. And a bunch of stuff changed on my um, VM, which was the actual creation, uh, sorry, my Hyper-V server, which is the actual creation of those VMs happening. And there's a bunch of skipped things, which is that um, housekeeping stuff at the top that I also skipped. So the result of all of that is now we have two VMs running um, with the eight gigs of memory that I asked for. And Lenovo keyboards are backwards, so yeah. Um, again, the Ansible account down the bottom there with the display name, that's um, all uppercase and a non-standard but known password for my administrator because I put that in via the um, uh, via the variables. And while we're in here, I'll quickly show some stuff that's about to change and I want to uh, show it. So, um, yeah, and we didn't provide a DNS server, so it's set 8.8.8.8, and I know that's small, sorry about that. Um, and I wanted to point out here that um, LM hosts by default is enabled, NetBIOS is, um, sorry, LM hosts is enabled, NetBIOS is set to default, and uh, file and printer sharing is enabled as well. So all of that, show me everything goes well is about to change. So there would be nothing stopping you from um, effectively doing a golden image. So you could, you could sysprep. Um, So you would you would need to yes. Um, although strictly speaking, this um, reference image has never been booted before. It's straight off the um, ISO. So I'm not sure if it would already have the ID in there, just because of how I've generated that. I need to check. So let's sign out of that because I learnt during practice if I, if I don't sign out of that, um, things go slow. Uh, so a demo lab now um, has those two VMs running on Hyper-V and we've verified that I've got WinRM connections going to both of them. And at this point, I've got a pre-programmed um, time for a drink that I want to take. And also, um, can any, for the prize of some chocolates, can anyone tell me what my naming scheme is? Like where those names come from? No, close. Sorry? Oh, sorry, what was that? No. Not quite. I know where you're going with Bang, though. Might be a bit too deep of a cup. They're um, Sith Lords. So rather than giving one person a box of chocolates, everyone can come get one afterwards if you want. Um, yeah, so. Yes, config time. So. Uh, four or five minutes. Close that, close that and start running this one. Mm. 
Yes. Sorry, I should have said that. Yeah. So I'm SSH'd onto my Linux box in that terminal. Um, that's nice. Let's turn that down. In fact, I believe there's even, I think there's an actual module for it, yeah. For, so that was, um, is it possible to run in Windows updates? And yes. And the only reason, of course, I'm not here is because that'll take a while. <laughs> so I'll start that running. Um, so baseline config, this is um, just the general settings that I want applied to every machine. Um, so the first thing I do, similar to checking if um, the VM exists, I'm checking to see if the installed server has a desktop environment or if it's server core, because there's a step later on that I only do with a desktop experience because server core doesn't, um, doesn't support it. Uh, then, of course, brand new box, so I need to install the NuGet provider if I want to be um, installing uh, PowerShell modules. Uh, so this is my boilerplate for checking if it's there um, and installing it if it's not. And like above, um, setting that Ansible changed um, based on whether or not it needed to install the NuGet provider. Um, then we start getting into chocolatey because of course I want chocolatey on all of my boxes. Um, now the thing about this module, and it just did it there, uh, the thing about that module is you can just go and say, um, I want this package installed, and if chocolate is not installed, it will install it for you. I like to be explicit about saying, this is the step where I install chocolate. Normally because, um, well one, because I like to be specific about that, um, and you might want a specific version installed and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I also do things like setting my um, sources and other settings um, for chocolatey as well, so I, I sort of need to do that before I try and st install stuff. Um, let's catch back up. Um, so, like I mentioned, got that uh, repository running on my machine, so I don't need to reach out to the community repository. Um, so I'm using the WinChocolatey source module to do that, um, and. So telling it where that source is and the username and password to connect to it. By default, this module always reports changed because it's always assuming that the password needs updating because it's got no way of knowing what the password is set um, and if it differs. Um, so what I've told it is, and I'll grab that. Um, so what I've told it is only update the password when you're creating the source. Um, it does mean a code change if I do update the password and I do need this to update the password. Um, but it means if I rerun this, it's not going to try and update that password every time and report a change when it's not needed. Um, then to make sure that I'm not reaching out to the community repository, I disable access to it. And then finally I install my packages. Um, so. You'll remember in my inventory that I had a list of baseline packages with a name set against them. I can also, well, first, um, name's the only mandatory variable that I need to be able to install something, because of course if I don't know what I'm installing, I can't install it. Optionally, I can also tell it a version, um, any package parameters I need when I'm installing it. Um, and I dynamically set the state based on the version. So I default to latest. Actually, this is cool. Um, you can do logic within these um, alongside your variables here. So I'm saying um, to set this to latest, if I don't provide a version number, if I do provide a version number, I'm gonna set it to downgrade. And basically what downgrade allows you to do is, um, it could install a newer version if the, the version you've asked for is newer than what's installed. 
but it can also go and reinstall an older version if that's what you've asked for and a newer version is currently installed. Then we loop through all of those packages um, and install them one by one. So each iteration through the loop is denoted by an item, or the item variable. Um, and you'll see here that there was actually an error while trying to install. So I'm prepping for this demo. I broke my Nexus repository. It's actually a pretty easy fix, but instead of fixing it, I snapshotted it at that point so that I could always go back to it being an error so that I can show some error handling. Um, so I don't actually, other than for the error handling, I don't need the output from this module, but I register, register the output and I say, if this task failed, so, um, well, other way around, I say keep trying until the result isn't failed and you can retry up to three times. So you can see in that console output there, um, it failed and it was trying to install a package and it had three retries left. And for whatever reason, it retries and it works. Um, and it does that consistently. Um, so, cool. But it was a good opportunity to show that. Um, then finally, if we um, are not running on server core, and we've got a back info description set, which we do. Um, it's going to go install um, back info, which is just a tool for setting the uh, information on the wallpaper that's similar to BG info, but I like the output of it better, uh, like the result of it better. Um, so it's going to create a directory for that, drop the exe on disk, drop a wallpaper on disk. Um, evaluate a template for the configuration and the only reason that's a template again is because it needs uh, the back info description to go into that config so it knows what to display. Um, and then finally it's going to create a shortcut so that um, it actually runs when we log in. And all of that ran we got exactly the same result on both of our VMs here in the recap, um, which means ideally everything worked. Um, nothing failed. So if we go across and I'll pick on the same VM, what we should see. There. Yeah. Press the right buttons helps. So, we should see in a moment the background update. And of course, it always takes longer when you're watching it. There we go. Um, so, using BG Info, then we know what machine we're on, um, get some hardware information about it, all that sort of stuff. And of course, um, because they were my baseline packages, we've got 7-zip and Notepad installed now as well. All right, so of course my actual baseline, um, it works a bit longer than that, but it'll do for a demo. All right, now let's make these servers actually do something. Um, one thing you'll notice as we get into this is what has been happening so far is each step runs and it runs on one of the VMs, and then it runs on the other VM, and they're always in the same order. Um, and if you happen to be watching it while it's running, it doesn't move on to the second host until the first host is finished. So it's working through them, through each task one at a time, and each server one at a time. So if a task on a server takes 10 minutes, that task is gonna take a total of 20 minutes, because it needs to wait for each host to finish. Um, so that's how Ansible runs by default. You can change that um, by setting the strategy. Um, so the free strategy basically says, run through the tasks, run through the hosts as fast as you can, don't wait. Um, and hopefully we see that as this goes, and I should probably start it because IIS takes a while to install. Um, now, 
you'll also see that I'm referencing um, the group Hyper-V guests now, rather than my individual VMs. Um, it's just another way you can target your host. You could put all in there and it would run against all of them. Um, now, if you had hundreds of Hyper-V guests, you probably wouldn't want the free strategy to be just running on all 100 of them at once. Um, so you can control how big the batches are using the um, serial parameter argument, whatever it's called. Um, so you could set that to say three and it would run on three of them at once or 10 and it would run on 10 of them at once. Um, so I don't need that here because I've only got two guests, but um, yeah, it's doing this thing. So I have a feeling we can talk through this faster than it can install, I hope. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is install IAS and we're using the win feature module for that. And what this module allows you to do is you can say, yeah, I want all the sub features and yes or no, I want all the management tools. So that'll be IAS manager, it'll be um, Hyper-V manager. It's also the PowerShell tools um, associated with the feature. Um, and I'm grabbing the output of that just in case the box needs to be restarted as a um, result of installing that feature. Now, IIS doesn't, but if I was installing, say, Hyper-V, that does need a reboot, so this would handle that reboot for us. Um, and what's cool about the Win reboot module, um, which helps with that, um, the Windows update thing as well, is it will trigger the reboot, and then it does effectively what that wait for connection thing does, which it'll hold execution of the playbook against that host until the host is back up and reachable. Um, so you don't need to worry about, oh, I need to reboot, which means I'm gonna need to rerun this thing or um, put an explicit pause in there or anything. Um, I knew I could talk faster than the IS and so. Um, so I've got a, a demonstration website, which I definitely didn't code because I, last time I did a website, it was in Notepad and Dreamweaver. So I, yeah, I'm not trusting myself to do that. Um, so I downloaded a, uh, that website says it's Creative Commons. I'm not sure what, if that's legitimately the, the license on it, but it's a demonstration website anyway. Um, and we are going to copy the zip file containing that onto disk. Uh, and we unzip that uh, into a directory. Now, this win unzip is another one of those ones that by default will always, it will always try and unzip and it will always um, report changed. Unless you go and tell it, what it something that it creates. Now, if it sees that, um, it's not gonna try the unzip. So if you happen to create the folder that it's going to unzip into and then says, say, this creates that folder, then it's not gonna unzip on you. And um, that has bit me. Cool, there we go. So you can see here, Bain has finished its IS install. It's evaluated that it doesn't need to do the reboot. Um, and it did that ahead of the other VM. And the other VM, has just now got to that point as well. Um, so you can see there, they're doing it at the same time. And you can imagine if the second VM had only just started to do that IIS install, we would be sitting here even longer. Now, we're setting up two web servers. Um, one of them's production, one of them's development. And I sort of want to know which is which when I'm looking at the website. So I'm going to patch the style sheet um, to change something between the two of them. And just for simplicity, we're doing that with a template, um, which basically I've found one of the colors, one of the very obvious and hard to miss areas where there's color. And I've said, if environment is defined and the environment is production, use this color, which from memory is blue or are blue. And if it's not that, so if it's development, QA, anything else, use this color, which should be orange. Um, and you'll see, so this is a ginger expression. And 
um, instead of the double curly braces, which does the variable substitution, it's curly brace percent sign. Um, and this is, this is where I really start loving um, Ginger 2, well, the templates in general, because you can do things like um, for each loops on data and populate files and all sorts. And um, when I really, f um, one thing I've really enjoyed doing, is, well, enjoyed doing. One thing that was really cool, um, which made me realize the power of this is, um, say you define permissions for a particular service you've installed in a file, you can go, okay, everyone gets this, developers get this, and ops gets this. Um, and it's all just based on the, um, what you've set in a variable, and it's one file instead of going, okay, I need to maintain three different files for the three different levels of permissions, or um, whatever. Um, so we patched the style sheet, we're gonna remove the default website, create a, our demonstration website pointing at that path where we unzipped the um, website. And uh, the first time I did that, it worked fine. The second time I did it, the websites wouldn't load. Um, so I threw in an IIS restart. Um, if, so if we've created the demo site, I'm gonna restart, uh, run IIS reset. And what that should allow now uh, is we should be able to um, zero dot that. Really should have just done a host file on this box so I could see it. So if I go to the IP address for my production machine, load the website, it's got blue. Um, so I know I'm on my production website. And if I go to the other IP address, all going well, orange, brown, orange. Um, I swear it's orange up here. <laughs> um, so I can tell visually um, which one I'm on. I'm not sure if you've ever, line in business app has a giant red bar or something across the top of it when you're in dev rather than prod. Um, Was there any? No, that was IIS, okay. Now, very last thing, which we have time for, that's good. Um, we're going to very lightly um, run some security settings on these boxes as well. Um, so my actual hardening playbook uh, probably takes 45 minutes to an hour to run because it's huge. Um, this one hopefully doesn't take that long. Um, but what I actually wanted to show with this one is how you can, because it is still a reasonably large file at 250 odd lines, is how to run bits of it at a time rather than the whole thing. So there is the concept of tags. Um, so you can tell Ansible run any tasks tagged with the string or run any tags that aren't tagged with the string so you can exclude tags, you can include tags. Um, if you tag something as always, it'll naturally, as you'd expect, always run. So what I can say is if I just want those uh, network bits to run, I can say, I think it's plural, we'll find out. Well, it didn't complain, so I must have remembered right. Um, now, technically, um, I've used blocks here again to simplify things a bit for me. Um, sorry, I didn't actually explain what blocks do. Effectively, it just takes a set of tasks and logically groups them. So you can do things like this. I can say um, tag, ta what, when you tag a block, it applies that tag to any task under that block. So it just saves me having to go tag, tag, tag down this list of, um, uh, down this list of tasks. Um, so what I'm doing for general network hardening, 
of disabled NetBIOS, of disabled WINS and LM hosts, uh, well, LM hosts lookup, of also disabled uh, file and printer sharing, unless I specify in my inventory that this is a file or printer server, um, which neither of these are, so it disabled it on both of them. And that ran nice and quick, and it's done. So the, and that was all, okay, one of those was PowerShell. Uh, then the next two, uh, user rights and audit policies. So we can specify multiple tags. Good. Now, uh, let me hide the networking staff. Audit policies. Um, there's, so this uses those new, um, the more granular audit policies that you'll find in, um, in the security settings there rather than the old legacy ones. And they use subcategories. You can find a list of those subcategories at the URL that I've provided there. One caveat about doing it via this Win Audit Policy System module is that it won't be reflected in the GUI, which bugs me. But you can verify that the settings have taken by running an um, audit poll um, against those subcategories, or I guess you could split the whole thing out and dig through it. Um, so as a couple of examples here, I've got uh, credential validation. We're looking at both success and failure. Uh, count lock at out just failure, and sensitive privilege use, success and failure. So just a couple of examples there. Again, the full list of what these subcategories are uh, um, in that link. And then user rights. Um, specific module for this, which is nice. Um, so here I want to ensure, uh, I want to ensure that my administrators group is the only group that can access the computer over the network. So we use the set action for that. So that clears out that group and ensures that administrators are the only thing in there. Yep. Did you say that you should use a simple Yes. And I, I think that's written up in the modules documentation as well. Um, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> um, and then conversely to allowing administrators access, I want to explicitly deny um, guests access over the network. Um, but instead of set here, I'm using add, which then honors what's already in that user right and adds guests to it, if it obvious, again, if it needs to, because if it's already in there, it'll just skip over um, just going to rerun the rest of that. So, sorry, I'm re running now this whole playbook without a tag on it. Um, so we should see at the start a bunch of green because we've already run those first three tags, so it doesn't need to actually apply anything. Um, the final one I'm doing here is removing the administrator's rights from debug programs, and that's using the remove um, action. One thing to be aware of here is Ansible has this function called become, which, say if you were running against a Linux host, it's effectively sudo on Linux. Um, if you find you need to use become on a Windows box, you'll need that debug program's permission back. So what I've had to do is, um, if I know I'm using become, because all of my machines have that right removed, I have to add it back in, do the become step, and then remove it again. Um, it's just one thing to be aware of, because the error coming back when you try it, isn't um, isn't helpful. So it's weird. I expected to need to use it more, and I couldn't. Sorry. the The question was, um, what functionality does become unlock effectively? Um, Maybe. I need to go back and look at where I have had to use it. And it's own like a lot I've I've been doing a lot of Ansible on Windows and I've only need to worry about it like twice. Which was weird. Yes, and you can Yeah. 
so you could, um, so that comment was you can specify which account um, you can become when you become as well. Um, so you could, for example, have an account that already has this right if you need it and just swap over to that. Yeah. Um, all right, let's run through the last of this bit. Uh, whoops. All right. Ah. Um, all right, security policies. Um, these are all going through the Win Security Policy um, module. Eventually, you get down to the point where um, you're doing it via registry values. I had never found a good resource for. Um, what all of these value, these registry values were. Um, so as I said there, what I ended up doing was I would export from um, secedit.exe, make my change um, in the GUI, and then re-export and compare the difference. And it would highlight what the value was, where it was. It took a long time, because I had a lot of settings to set. Um, Luckily, um, a lot of the common ones are easier, like not stirring, store, stirring, not storing passwords using reversible encryption um, is just setting a key, um, an easy to remember key, and a value. Um, a lot of these are backwards, so the policy display text is do not store passwords. Um, the key is clear text passwords. So you're disabling clear text passwords, but you're enabling do not install. I don't like it. <laughs> Same with disable guest account is um, disabling enable guest account. Um, but so going through this, um, enabling the administrator account, I'm renaming the administrator account to something non-standard. So when we log back into LVM at the end, um, we'll see on the login screen, Summit Admin instead of Administrator. Um, and because I was using the newer audit policies up above, I'm also forcing the use of those instead of the legacy ones. Um, just because I needed a example of a registry values one, because that was my key um, pain point. Now, <clears throat> after running those, they don't take effect until the host reboots. So what I've done with this is I've said, in this block, if anything changes, um, go and notify this thing called restart hosts. So Ansible has this, um, has um, the term as handlers, and rather than say having a task there with a bunch of if statements for, hey, if this thing changed or if that thing changed, go and do this, you can have it just sitting there listening. And if something notifies it or says, hey, you need to run, um, it'll run. So you can have lots of tasks, and if even one of them notifies your handler, it'll execute. By default, it executes at the end of the play. Um, so this one here, um, restart host, I actually wanted it to run midstream. Uh, so what I did is um, I specifically said, at this point, if there's any handlers that need to be run, run them. Um, and you'll see, I've tagged that as always, so regardless of what, um, regardless of what tags I'm using, this will always see if there's a handler that needs running. Um, although in this example, it's only this one block, so I could have just tagged it as set policies and it would have done what it needed to do. Um, and like the tags, what notify does is effectively applies that notify to all of the tasks that sit under it. Um, yes. So what actually happened there is midway through the playbook, my host restarted. Um, I didn't notice because it kept running and um, everything's happy. Yep. 
it's, it's configurable. Um, and if it doesn't come back, it will error. Um, I don't remember what the default is, but I, yeah, it's, it's pretty long. Um, I've never had to adjust it because, it, yeah. All right, uh, last little bit. Uh, firewall policies, I, no, these ones are fine. Um, so I've just got a couple of examples of setting firewall rules here using the Win Firewall rule module. Um, I do like to set my group on these to something that tells me, hey, these were created by Ansible, so I know not to touch them. Um, because if I touch them next time my playbook runs, they're going to change on me. Um, so I've got an example here of blocking um, a range of ports, uh, specifically on TCP, the same again on UDP, um, and that's blocking inbound access. I'm also blocking outbound access from the calc executable, just because of that nasty, nasty calculator. Um, and this is both x64 and x86. Um, and then because we're running our website, um, I need to ensure that I can get to it. And because this is a demo environment and I'm not doing HTTPS, that's port 80. Um, the final thing is local group policy. Um, now I'll point out uh, admx.help, I found ironically very helpful for um, finding all the values to pop in here. Um, now I'm s doing all this via, I'm setting these local group policy settings via a module called policy file editor, that's why I needed to know where the policy files were sitting on disk. Um, and I'll skip over that first one. But effectively for all of these, I am um, finding the key that I need to change, what the value name, well, defining the key that I need to change, the value that I'm looking at, what I want it set to, and what data type it is. Um, and then to make sure I'm only making changes when I need to, I'm grabbing that entry from the file, and whoop, all the way over here, checking if the data that comes out of it is the data that I want. Um, if it is, of course we don't make a change. If it isn't, we're going to change it and set it to true. And then we'll say, okay, we need to run GP update because, of course, group policy changed. Uh, and that's another handler which is down the bottom here. Now, the previous time I notified the display name, which was restart host, um, apply updated policy was a bit verbose for me. So you can tell it, listen for this other thing that's not your name. Um, so I set that to run GP update and that's what I notify of. Um, now, one thing is I wanted to set some stuff for my firewalls which have um, different zones. So you've got your domain, private and public. Um, effectively, I was setting the same policies on all three of those so I needed, I didn't want to list out all of them three times. Um, so I did, again, split those out into their own tasks file, uh, which is here. And you'll see, basically, it's going through this and just dropping in either domain, public, or private um, into the item variable. Um, so here I can say I'm setting the domain profile, and all that really does is change the, um, the key that you're targeting because um, that's specific to the zone. Uh, so it's going to loop over this file three times and just swap out which zone it's targeting. Um, and all we're doing for the demonstration here is making sure it's turned on, which is a good start. Uh, setting the default inbound connection to block and the default outbound connection to allow. And whoops, it's okay, we're not going back into there. And that all ran. Um, one thing I'll point out here is despite the, despite the strategy being set to free, if both of, or if multiple targets happen to finish the same step at the same time, it'll output them together. So it's not necessarily going to double your output from Ansible, it will group them together when it can. Uh, the people that were here early saw me change it so that that screen wasn't meant to turn off. <laughs> Um, all right, let's pick on Bain for this time. Oop. 
No. The Novo keyboards, I can't. Um, so, our administrator account's been renamed to Summit Admin. Uh, hopefully I'm not stressing it too much by... If we look at the firewall, we should see, uh, well, one, that it's controlled by group policy because it is now. Um, it's on, default actions are set, and we've got our rules defined um, with Ansible as the group tag so we can uh, see them nice and easy in there. And one last thing. because I didn't come in here to look at it earlier. Uh, file and printer sharing has been disabled. Uh, and the various things in there that I pointed out that weren't disabled are now disabled. Um, so all of that stuff applied and um, it worked. So. Ooh, I'm not sure. Possibly. All right. So, takeaways. Uh, learn to love YAML. Um, I have a very love-hate relationship with YAML. 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 Um, and, yeah, as I said at the start, keep an eye on those indents because they will bite you. Um, you... I do cover that. Okay, you need uh, the WinRM configured, uh, WinRM configured on your Windows hosts, so that could be if you're doing AWS, that'll be potentially a, a user data script when you're spinning up an EC2 instance. That could be a script extension on uh, Azure. Um, as you saw here, I dropped um, some scripts to do it into my um, image that I was spinning up in Hyper-V. Um, now, SSH is possible. It's currently experimental. I had issues with it, but that was two years ago and I haven't touched it again. So it may be better now and you may have better luck with it. Um, do remember that Ansible tends to be Linux first. Like I said, all those modules had win underscore on them um, and the Linux versions don't. If you're Googling for help, make sure you specify Windows or you'll end up down some weird rabbit holes that don't apply. Um, and this is more relevant when we're doing uh, an AWS version of this demo um, because there was a lot more PowerShell in this than there normally would be. But do make use of those available modules, um, but don't be afraid to use your PowerShell knowledge to plug the gaps where they exist. Um, and as with everything um, automation-wise, use variables, make everything reusable. Um, yeah. And... I almost want to do an entire talk on just the Ginger 2 templates because they are my favorite part of this. Um, yeah, they're awesome. Now, next steps. Um, you will see that I started splitting um, groups of tasks out into their own task files. Um, I recommend starting to build up um, those as roles in your own internal collections. So, for example, you might have an infrastructure collection which has, this is how we spin up VMs. You might have a Windows collection for, here's all the stuff we do on Windows. You might have a Linux one as well. Um, and then they just become reusable nuggets of stuff that you've figured out and can reuse everywhere. Um, consider a platform like automation platform, uh, Ansible Automation Platform, what used to be Ansible Tower, um, AWX or Semaphore, which is a third party tool that looks pretty good. Um, aim to be, aim to write your playbooks such that you're confident enough to rerun them anytime. <laughs> um, it's often harder said than done, but at least rerun them periodically to correct configuration drift. Um, so thank you. Um, the demo code.
demo code's available. At the moment, that points to my GitHub repo. Eventually, it'll point to the Summit repo because my PR's not been merged yet. Um, do rate the session, please. Um, I think we've got a couple of minutes, so are there any questions? So I, the question was, I've been using PowerShell for some things that were, there are modules for. What's my preference or what, yeah. So my personal preference is, so there's two schools of thought there, but my personal preference is to use the modules um, and fall back to PowerShell when I can. So some of what you saw here is potentially there wasn't a module at the time or I couldn't get the module to work how I wanted at the time and I just haven't looped back to see if it's changing. So question there was, I was changing a lot of things there that could have been done via group policy. Um, when should you use that via this? So I don't have access to group policy. So that's why I had to go the route of doing it via um, Ansible. I would, if I was in, an, in a domain, domain environment, I would probably prefer to do it via GPO and just um, manage it that way because, yeah, I just would. <laughs> there was one, yes. Yes, so those, if this was back at work, they probably would be roles. And they'd just be in my internal collection and be using them that way rather than calling tasks like that. Um, yeah, I, I sort of see it as a, it's in my playbook, then I migrate it to its own task file and then I realize I'm using that a few times, so okay, that can be, that can be a role now. Um, I think, sorry, we're, I think we're over time now. Um, but feel free to come up, ask questions, grab a chocolate. Um, if you find me around, I've got more chocolate in there, so feel free to hassle me at lunch and um, I'll have more. Thank you.